So I hope you'll grab your Bible. Go ahead and do that. You can turn to Genesis chapter 39 is where we're going to be today. As Taylor noted, we are in this series we've called Stuck. Maybe you're here and you're stuck today. I uh, have great memories growing up uh, with my dad and uh, brothers. I have two brothers. And we would, uh, in the summertime, we'd often find ourselves at the lake, uh, which was just north of Charlotte, if you've been to that part of the world, Lake Norman, if you've ever been around there, just north of Charlotte. We'd go up there. Um, and uh, had a little, little house where we'd get to go and ski and all the fun. But one of the memories I have uh, was when the water was just right during certain times of the year, um, there would be this little cove right next to our house. And it was just at a point where the water would go down and it was just mud. And of course, my friends and I found this spot. Right. And it was a big, just big area with mud, elementary age, probably middle school into high school. And we go over there and have these big mud fights. And what was really interesting is when you would get into it, like not just a little bit of mud. I'm talking about going up, like all the way up above your knees, up to your waist. And we're throwing mud at each other and just having a blast until you realize that you're stuck. And the more you try to get out, the more you're stuck and the deeper you'd go. So we just kind of leave guys out there and laugh and just go run off and have fun. But um, it was wild. You know, this is true. Like if you've ever been stuck in the snow or if you've been stuck like in a four wheeler in the mud, the more you put on the gas, the deeper you get stuck trying to get unstuck, the more you get stuck. And that can happen in our lives spiritually as well. It can happen in certain seasons of our lives, right? And maybe you're here today and you feel stuck. This can play out in all kinds of ways in our lives. You might feel like you're stuck in the season uh, of life. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in a job and you can't really get out of it because it's, well, you're making money and you don't like it, but you're, that, you're stuck. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in a relationship. That can happen. You might be stuck in a season where you feel like you're in a season of, of loss or grief uh, I would say there, you're not stuck. There's, a, there's, a, there's time, right? And the Lord is, is working in all of that. But the thing I want you to see today, we've already been talking about this with Joseph. There's no better place to go uh, than to think about someone's life who, who was stuck over and over again. But here's what happens. We looked last week at the fact that he, off, he, he kind of wasn't, wasn't like his best friend all the time. Like he got stuck in certain places because he was, we left him as this cocky, 17-year-old, kind of self-adulating, prideful teenager. Then something happens in his life. Something happens. And I think it's what we saw last week in chapter 37. Uh, he got stuck, literally stuck in the pit for a moment. And I believe it was then. I believe he was stuck in a place that he did not choose that was chosen for him. Because here's what can happen. Sometimes we get stuck because of decisions we have made, right? And we can wrestle with that even today. Let's be honest. Some of us are stuck because of things we've done. Some of us are stuck spiritually because of things or patterns that we've allowed into our lives. Maybe you're stuck in sin, if we're honest. And we are into some habitual pattern of sin. And you're stuck. Other times we get stuck because of decisions made for us. In fact, isn't it true? Much of life are circumstances. We call them situations. What we might think are accidents. We end up in places that we would have never chosen and we get stuck. And then other times it's other people's decisions. Uh, Joseph's brothers hated him at a point along the way. And we're going to see how God uses all this. The point being that God does meet us in our circumstances. He's with us. And I want you to be encouraged today. I believe it's why the Lord brought you here today, to be encouraged by his spirit that he is with you and he helps you overcome your circumstances. We'll see, how does that happen? He will help you overcome your temptations in life. He'll help you overcome even injustice that has come your way by either what you think are just circumstances or life stuff or certain people who've come at you, he is with you and he's leading you. And so we're going to talk about this. It's right out of, uh, again, Genesis 39. We're going to look at verses 1 through 23. And the first thing I want you to see here is, and if you're taking notes, you can do this. God overcomes our circumstances. All right. We were singing about overcoming earlier. We've noted that many times coincidences, accidents are actually the very details that God is at work. And you need to see this. God is sovereign over your life today. 
Again, we can throw rocks at everybody else and blame everybody else for where we are. Even blame God. He's big enough for that. We can find ourselves in a place and go, why am I here? And the Lord is at work in your life right now, regardless of what you're going through. The, the, the way that God works, he shows up in person and he is present with you and he's at work. What we see in Joseph's life, of course, is that the promise made to Abraham way back in Genesis 12 is now being played out all the way into the life of Joseph. And now we have this critical bridge that sets the course for the rest of God's promise to his people that ultimately comes to us. Only God can do this. Only God can take the worst situations of our lives and turn it around for good. And this is what he's doing in your life. So now we get to the story of Potiphar. And we're going to find it there in verse 1. It starts with this. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. It's always, do you know, it's always going down, down, down to Egypt. Um, that's not only ge geographic, it is true, it's south, but there's, there's something else going on. It's always down to Egypt, and this is what's happening to Potiphar. You might remember he was sold into slavery, these Ishmaelites going on this trade route, and he is sold, and now we're picking up the rest of the story. But here's what's happened. In chapter 38, there's this grisly interlude about Judah and Tamar that doesn't mention Joseph at all. And so you wonder how much time here do we have? I mean, I think it's pretty, there's not too much time, but what, what's happened, Joseph's life is about to shift because oftentimes it's when we're in the pit and some of you need to hear this today in the deepest moments of grief and loss is when God is doing his best work in us. If we took the mic this morning and we said, let's just spend the rest of the day doing this. Let's talk about when God moved most mightily in your life. And if you're old enough, been through some stuff, you're going to say, it was the darkest, most difficult time in my life. And God pulled me out of the pit. And it's why I am who I am today. And it's why I'm giving glory to him because he did a work in me. Something happens from chapter 37 to 39. And I believe it's when he was in the pit, tossed into slavery now. And it says here, and Potiphar, all right, which means, by the way, the one that Ra has given Ra was the sun god. He's now in Egypt, as we'll see. An officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian. Look at all these descriptors. And bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. Okay, So he is a man who is in a high position of leadership. And Joseph finds himself in his house. And some of y'all, if you know this story at all, you're going, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Because we know about... Potiphar's wife, right? We don't know her name, but we know he's got a wife and we're going to see what happens here. So you may know, uh, again, Joseph comes from the most jacked up family that you'll ever find. Uh, his father, Jacob, was, you know, he was a, he was a trickster. He was, he was a wrestler. He was the one that God would use, though, to bring the promise now to Joseph and his brothers, the 12 who would end up being, right, the 12 tribes of of, of Israel, which is crazy to think of, these hateful, uh, ruthless brothers who are out to kill him, by the way, leaving him for dead. And, and what, jo what Jacob did, he did love his son. The love of a son passed on, I mean, the love of a father passed on to children is a major, major piece of life and well-adjusted people. Oftentimes when I'm, when I'm talking to someone, maybe we're looking to hire somebody on their staff, or whatever, hey, tell me about your relationship with your dad. I just want to hear more about that. And when I, when I come across someone who's really been loved well by a father, uh, generally, you, you know, that's going to translate. That's going to that's gonna then go to transfer from our love of a father. We see it in him and we, we're able to connect that with the Lord. Uh, not that there are perfect fathers, but we have one who's a perfect father. Maybe some of you don't have relationships like that or haven't grown up like that. And you know the impact that it has on your life. Uh, if you don't have this blessing of the father. Now, Joseph knew that his father loved him, right? You remember the, the favored one, right? But he, his other brothers didn't know so much. His other brothers were hateful, again, ruthless, because Jacob was, he was a passive father. Passivity shows up in a lot of different ways. There's a little word for fathers. But, uh, but what, I think in a word, inattentive to situations in the family. He was removed 
And, and, and what, what happens in his family there is that Jacob did not step in when he could have. And if attention is the beginning of devotion, then attention to the proper things, okay, attention and focus, being present uh, to the proper things of life and what our souls really need is wisdom. And so what, what we must say to dads today, I have a two-word message to dads every Father's Day, be there, be there. And I know even that can strike terror in the heart of a dad, like, oh man, I got a job, I got all this going on, I got a thing, I got this going, I got this happening, I got all this happening, I got my marriage, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to do all the things, and it's really hard. It's hard to be a dad. In, in this day and age. It's hard to be a mom. It's hard. But when we bring attention, okay, and, and the right kind of attention, well, we saw that with Jacob too, interesting case study, but attention is formation. And this is true in your personal life. Whatever you bring your attention to, whatever you focus on is going to shape your life. We talk about this often. Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will find its rightful place, you could say. Because there's only one first. Who or what has captured your attention these days? For all of us. And if you, if, can you say, the thing that captures my attention the most is God and my relationship with Jesus Christ. Has captured my attention. Now, how would you know? Well, if you're a father, if you're a parent, it would be, uh, let me ask you this. Do you focus as much? Do you celebrate, bring value then? Because what we celebrate, we value is the message we're sending. Do you celebrate uh, your, your child's academic endeavors? Do you focus on that? You're trying to get all the help. They can get, are you focusing on their athletic uh, you know, prowess, the fact they're going to make the NBA or the WNBA someday, and you're just going at it because you're just giving everything you've got? Or do you celebrate more their spiritual formation and growth? Are you focused in on that more than anything else in their lives? And yes, that happens in the mix of all the things that are going on. What do you value the most? Your children know it like food to the body. They are receiving it but what has captured your attention? Because oftentimes it can be things other than that. But listen, dads, I just want to encourage you. And it's a, it's a challenge. Be there. Be there. You, you cannot parent from a distance, all right? Like uh, some of y'all don't know this. Some of you dads love to play golf. Um, I don't mind telling you, I'm a I'm, I'm pretty good golfer. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, has anybody ever uh, like hit a hole in one in the room? Anybody ever hit a hole in one? Come on, let's go. We've got several of them. Wow. So I, you know, I don't want to brag. I don't do this, but I'm going to go there. I've, I've had several hole-in-ones. Um, I mean, I, truly. Uh, I'm talking about putt-putt. I'm talking about mini golf. Because um, mini golf, you know, I'm, I crush, I'm like, I'm not crushing it in mini golf. I've had many hole-in-ones in, in mini golf because, watch this, error increases with distance. Like you could crush one, you know, off the tee box, 250 yards right down the fair, middle of the fairway on a par five. You're still 250 yards away. Like, and then that's what keeps you going, right? Bam. Like, whoo, I'm right in the middle, man. I'm like, gosh, Scotty Chef, I got nothing on me except maybe hundred yards. But, um, but he got nothing. And then my next shot, right? Bam. I'm in the woods. I'm out in nature looking around all the animals and all the stuff. Because here's the maddening thing about golf is every shot on every hole could be better except one. The one that goes in the hole, right? Like that was an awesome shot. Yeah, it didn't go in. Because error increases with distance. I am deadly from about like a foot away. <laughs> crushing it. Be there. Be close. Be attentive because passivity... It's brought about by an inattentiveness. And it doesn't matter how old your kids are. Yes, they can grow up, move out. And if you don't push them out and get out, then you, have, you failed as a parent, you could argue. But you're still in their lives. Continue to express your love to your children. Okay, that was all, all free. I just want you to be encouraged. Uh, that's for dads for free. I got, I'm not even chat, uh, verse two. Here we go. Um, but now we see, here's, what, here's, what, here's why I say all that. Something happened in his life and I believe it was when he was in the pit and when he was sold into slavery. He got humbled, 
Real quick, because that's what God does. Because he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you're going through a humbling season right now, it's hard, but praise him for it. Lord, let me be right-sized before you so you can actually use me and you can be glorified through my life. In verse two, it says, here it is, here it is. Here's the operative phrase. And the Lord was with Joseph. Four times we see this. In verse two and three, 21 and 23 and varied uh, uh, iterations of this, the Lord was with Joseph. I want you to know today, listen, he is with you. You need to be reminded of this. You're like, I I don't feel him. No, he's with you. He's with you whether you feel like you're in exile in a foreign land. Look at this. He's enslaved. He has no power. He is powerless. His platform is one of oppression. He has no agency. The Lord is with him. And God is going to do a great thing. Look at what happens. He, He became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him. Others see that the Lord is with him. And you know, precisely because he was a slave. It's like, man, this guy is, he's like a servant. He's like a, he's all about it. And, the, and that the Lord caused all that he, he did to succeed in his hands. The Lord is with him. It's also worth noting that the narrator here, the writer says that it's, it's not Elohim. The word is not Elohim that describes the Lord. It's Yahweh. Oftentimes we think, oh yeah, God introduced himself to Moses. That comes later. The word is Yahweh here. And what's happening is, this is the God who is the God of Israel. This is not Elohim, kind of this general God. This is a personal, intimate God who's personally and intimately acquainted with Joseph. This is worth worth noting because we have the one who Ra, okay, Ra gave, is Potiphar. We have the Egyptian gods, and there's a bunch of them. Ra was the sun god, major god. Now we've got Yahweh's God, who's represented in Joseph. So watch and see what happens, right? The encouragement I want to bring. If you are in the Lord, if you know the Lord today, John 14, 17 says this, you have received the spirit of truth. This is Jesus, whom the world cannot receive. Because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him. And listen to this. He dwells with you and will be with you. Maybe the Lord brought you here today to remember God is with you. Because you forgot somewhere off on Thursday afternoon. You forgot when that thing happened that you never dreamed would happen. You forgot that he's with you. Because it's possible for us to go through hard times and and not see the Lord at work. But friends, I want to encourage you today. He's with you. He is with you. And that is success. That's what brings success to us. Whether you feel like you're in exile, you're stuck in some, some situation, he's with you. He's even with you, as we'll see, in your temptation. He's with you in all the things you're facing. Uh, in, in, in the in the book of Exodus in chapter 33, Moses, remember this, he says, he says, Lord, if you don't go with us, don't lead us out of here. And the Lord says, hey, my presence will give you success. And that word there, uh, I'll bring it to completion. I'll give you rest. Friends, listen, you need to hear this today. The presence of God in your life, Yahweh, the God, the promised one, Jesus Christ, who promises the Holy Spirit, his spirit is in you. He's with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And he's with you right now in this season of your life. And that is success. But here's what you must do. You've got to put yourself in position to hear from him. And and that's being in God's word. Are you in his word every day? Some of us forget because we're not. And and I'm I'm maybe preaching to the proverbial choir. Dad's way to go. Getting your family here on Father's Day and continue to do so. Put yourselves in position to hear from him and to follow him in prayer. Model that for your family, for your friends, for your roommates. Do that. Be in his word every day. Join us in our dwell reading. Get in a connect group. Join the church Be in fellowship. You're putting yourself in position. It's why we come here every week. We do this every week. The Lord said, gather together, gather together. Let's go. Remember, remember how much I love you. 
And then look at this in verse four. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house, that is Potiphar did, and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Look at this. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in his house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. He had no concern because Joseph was taking care of everything else. I was reminded of, uh, I think it's Jeremiah 29, 11. And then in chapter 29, where, where you, the people of, of God are in exile. This comes later on. But they find themselves in exile. And then Jeremiah says, hey, while you're there, seek the welfare of the city. Bless. Like, no, hold up. No, no, no. The Babylonians, they're the ones who brought us here. Enslaved, exiles, if you will. No, no, no. I want you to bless others around you right where I've planted you. And this is a good word for some of us who are like, man, this job I've got, Jeff, you don't understand. I got a boss. It's just, no, no, no. Bless everyone around me. Yeah, but uh, no, these people, I mean, they're like, like, don't even follow the Lord. I'm the only Christian in the whole place. It's crazy. It's wild. You are the light in that place. By the way you serve, by the way you, you stand out as different and you are seeking the welfare of everyone around you. And this is what Joseph's doing. And the Lord continues to raise him up. Now watch this. God overcomes our circumstances by being with us. Okay, don't miss that. But look at this. He also overcomes our temptations. Okay, so now let's dive into what could be the kind of the body of, of this message. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Uh-oh. He's, he's looking good is what, what's up. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on him. And I, we could dive into the meaning of that. It's really focused in on, right? Like locked in, not just, hey, he's handsome and moving on. No, she's locked in towards action is what this implies here. Lie with me, she says. But he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of my master, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you. Because, watch this, you are his wife. How then can I do this wickedness and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day, and look at this, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. One day, if you know this story, it starts to get sketchy. When he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house were there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, fled out of the house, got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand, and had fled the house. She called to the men of the household and said to, said to them, See, he, okay, Joseph, my husband has brought among us a Hebrew. This is a, uh, this is a racist kind of a statement, okay? This guy from far away to laugh at us, to make sport of us, okay? To toy with us is what this means. To toy with me and came in to lie with me and I cried out in a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and he fled, got out of the house. She setting him up. Then she laid up his garment by her, like exhibit A, until his master came home. And she told him all about, right, the same story. This Hebrew that you brought uh, among us came in. He's, he's making sport of me, laughing at us, just, just making, toying with us. But as soon as I lifted up my voice, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. Okay. So now we have, we have Joseph uh, dealing with this temptation. And I want to give, here's another, this is for dads, but really for all of us. This is for everybody. Um, this is for free. Like you get donuts and you get a sermon within the sermon. This is like bonus day for dads. Um, but it's really for everybody. I want to talk about overcoming temptation real quick. Because here we see an, an, the anatomy of, of temptation. 
It comes to all of us. Okay, this is, this is sexual temptation, but this applies to every one of us. I want you to think about something you're tempted with these days. It keeps coming at you and, and you are wrestling with it. Maybe some of you real quickly, you go, oh, I'm in a pattern of sin or I'm constantly, or, or watch this. Maybe you got, maybe somebody has their eyes on you. Maybe you've got your eyes on someone else who's not your spouse, who's not someone that you should be looking at or, or pursuing. This story outlines steps toward temptation and how we fall into sin through Potiphar's wife and then steps to avoid it, as we see in Joseph. Really interesting study here. And I want to talk about, about what it is, how to deal with it and overcome it. Just real quick. Okay, what it is. Temptation, of course, is a luring away from God's best for us. It's, it's a calling us towards evil action of some sort. Potiphar's wife's being tempted, all right, deals with it in a certain way. Joseph deals with it in another way. Now, what the Bible calls lust, okay, is what's going on here. Uh, we see this through the New Testament. We often think of, of sexual desire, lust, but the word is actually a word that's used much more broadly throughout Scripture. Lust can actually be at times good or bad, a strong passion for something, most often in the negative. Often it's lust for, uh, for power. In the New Testament, it's lust for money. It, over and over again, lust for more, for, for, uh, for, for material things. It's a lust of the eyes, which we see here, that leads then to sin. I'm going to call it love out of order. I, I like Augustine is the one in the city of God. He wrote that virtue is rightly ordered love. Think about that. Sin then is love out of order. We've talked about that before. It's disordered love. That's what lust is. Lust is, is, is a, you could say it's a love or a passion or desire out of order, out of place. And that's what we're seeing here. It follows the pattern that, that Potiphar's wife, she notices, okay, first with the eyes, then she starts to act towards it. She contemplated him. She thought more and more about him. Lust is a desire that's out of control. It's desiring pleasure without promise, without meaning, okay? It's, like, it's not unlike like, like porn. It's, it's seeking pleasure that is dehumanizing without the person, okay, in mind. Without, it's devoid of humanhood, okay? The person is created in the image of God and lust can't wait to get, love can't wait to give. Those, that's the big difference between the two, okay? So how do you deal with it? How to deal with, see, Joseph, he, okay, if she's the example, how not to, he's the example too. Look at what he does. He refuses, he takes action. He refuses to even be with her, be anywhere near her, okay? That's the first step. Some of you hear that today, by the way. I have talked to men throughout my ministry and men who are very close to me who I've said, okay, we know what's up. Um, sorry, you don't want me and a group of men showing up at your door step to say, we know what's up and we're here because we love you. And she needs to be removed from your life. And this can happen on, on all sides of the equation here, but he is removing himself from her altogether. This is a good word for some of us. And notice too, that he calls it what it is. He says, this is a wicked thing that you're trying to tempt me to do. He doesn't call it a momentary you know, hook up. He doesn't call it an affair. He said, this is wicked is what this is. Why does he say that? He tells us because you are Potiphar's wife, implying, of course, right? You're not my wife. You're someone else's wife. This is wicked. And ultimately he knows this too. If I were to fall into sin here, I'm sinning against God almighty. All sin is against God. Though it can destroy and be destructive in the lives of other people, but only in marriage do we, do we have the purity of God's design and purpose, where pleasure has a purpose and it points to God himself. And, and we, need to, we need to be real clear about this, friends, in our culture today. It's only in marriage where sex finds its purpose and God is calling us to live different lives and we need to be accountable to one another. So how do, you, how do you overcome it? Well, if the first was, uh, we look at Potiphar's wife to see here's, here's how it works, here's how temptation rolls. Uh, look at Joseph to overcome it. We look at God, uh, we, we look at how to, how to really avoid it. We look at God to overcome it. What do I mean by that? Well, he's the love above all loves. 
If, if it's love out of order, it's a love we've talked about. It's the expulsive power of a new affection that's found in Christ. It's in the gospel. It's a relational problem. When love gets out of order and lust leads to sin, it's because we are not pursuing him above all else to meet all of our needs. Lust demands an aggressive opposition. And it demands that we have community around us. And other men, frankly, I'm talking to men, but women as well. We have an incredible opportunity for you to be mentored, to get in men's groups, to be with other men. You can talk to Caleb Rhodes, who leads our men's ministry. He's preaching in the sanctuary today. And he's one you can reach out to and say, man, I want to know more about this. I need men in my life. Some of you men need to follow up and reach out to him. In 1 Corinthians 13, 10, 13, you might know that every time that we're tempted, it says that he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can, what you can stand. And with every temptation, which is common to all of us, he says there's an opportunity for you to overcome and he's going he's gonna to provide a way out. All right? This is so important to understand because the Lord always gives us a chance out. But here's what some of us need to hear today. When I was, uh, another, another memory from my childhood, I would go see our grandparents. They lived in Black Mountain, up in the mountains in North Carolina. And I remember as a kid in the car, looking out over the window, uh, out, out the window as we got higher and higher. And there were points along the way on this, on this windy road where, I guess this is back in the day, this sounds wild. There were, there were like no rails at certain points. And I could look down thousands you know, feet below into the valley. And I always often wondered, man, if dad got so close to that. Woo, we go, whoa, I imagine what could happen. How crazy would it be for me to say, hey, dad, see how close you can get to the edge before we go off. Like, let's just go. This is, a, this is wild. That's nuts, right? My dad being wise, here's, here's what, you see where I'm going here. How about we stay as far away as possible? How about we not get near the edge, but stay as far away as possible to avoid sin and to fall off, destroy our lives and fall into the valley. This is part of what the Lord's prayer is. When the Lord says, lead, he says, pray, lead us not into temptation. And you go, wait, uh, does the Lord tempt us? What? You know that temptations are often tests in the Bible. And in fact, some would argue, yeah, they're one and the same. You say, well, what's that about? Here's why we mess up. We think temptation, uh-oh, temptation leads to sin. Ugh. Oh, I'm being tempted, here comes sin. That's the next step. No, temptation leads to obedience. Temptation is the opportunity to obey and to grow. That's what's happened with Joseph. And so when we say, lead us not to temptation, we're saying, Lord, I humble myself before you. I don't want to be put to the test because I don't do well in the test. Keep me from the evil one. So some of us need to hear this today. And some of us, some of you right now need to do what it says in 2 Timothy 2.22. Flee from youthful lust. You need to run like Joseph has. And some of you need to tell someone, man, I am, I'm on the edge right here. And you're about to destroy your life if you don't turn from your sin and a pattern of sin. But look at what it says in verse 19 as I land this. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife had spoken, this is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. So finally, I want you to see God overcomes our injustice. The injustices that come our way. And, his, and, and Joseph, it says in verse 20, his master took him, put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, as if it's not bad enough. And he was there in prison, but the Lord was with Joseph. And he showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in sight of, in the sight of the keeper of the prison. This is unimaginable, right? What he's going through. It just, he's stuck over and over and over again. And some of you feel stuck. I just want to remind you, God is with you today. And then it says in verse 22, the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one. The Lord just kept giving him favor. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him over and over again. Whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So we're going to close our time in a special way. I want, to, I want to just challenge you with this. Friends, you're not a victim. If you're in Christ, you are not a victim. I don't, I don't care what you're going through, right? I do care. But whatever you're going through, you're not a slave. 
You, you're, not in, in, you're not captured by that thing. You are captured by the Lord. Turn your heart to him and, and what he has done for you, what he's accomplished for you, even in injustice. And many of us, we find ourselves in a place and we can say, ah, oh, I was that person. If that person hadn't done that, then I would be in that job and not this one. I would be, I would be doing this, right? If God hadn't done this thing. And instead, we need to turn to him and say, Lord, you are with me. Because we know this. God is the one who came to us. Christ was the one, right? He was the one who was betrayed by his own. He was the one who was put into prison, literally becoming one of us. He's taken by those who were, who were uh, watching him dream of a different kind of world. And they, ca- they took him. And, and they threw him in the pit. They, they enslaved him, if you will. They, they then crucified him so that he would be the substitute for us. He was put in the pit and he was literally resurrected, brought out and exalted so that every person on the planet and ultimately everyone would see someday that he's the one. And friend, you need to hear this today as we close our time. You, listen, you, we're no longer slaves. We're, we're going to just be reminded of that because it says in Romans 6, 17, 18, but thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart. From your heart, your motives have shifted. The pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. I love that. Who owns your heart? What's your highest love of all loves? You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. You've been set free, friends. We have power over sin because he is with us and we can live in a different way.